now that we have an approved medication for cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, we do bring in other specialties more readily than we might have before. Of course, for anyone that, you know, for being a dermatologist and most surgeon, you know, especially being community-based, I'm going to be looking to lean on my colleagues uh, in, in the other specialties, oncology, radiation oncology, and um, other surgical specialties as well. So, but now that there's an improved option, if, you know, one's not able to infuse that medication themselves and completely follow that patient and, and do everything that needs to be done, medical oncology is a, is a great resource for us. It, those that are infusing medications in their offices or using infusion centers, it allows us another option for these, for these patients to explain to them that there's something else they could do besides having surgery or besides having radiation. So, it, it, you know, in medicine, as we see the advancements uh, um, and these new drugs that were able to be approved uh, uh, more quickly than ever before, it's nice to be able to offer something to our patients, uh, at least that they have choices, and so they're able to make an informed decision about how, to, how, how they want to approach their tumor. Uh, the multidisciplinary treatment team should include both a Mohs uh, oncologic surgeon, a head and neck surgeon, uh, who the latter tends to be the one to manage lymph nodes, which is an important area of metastasis and failure, uh, the medical oncologist and the radiation oncologist. So uh, I think in the community setting, earlier involvement of those individuals is key. Once advanced uh, an aggressive cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma is recognized, that patient tends to now emerge and move away from the dermatologic oncologic surgeon and more toward the head and neck surgeon and more toward the medical or radiation oncologist. So although the Mohs surgeon is often the one who brings the case to the treatment team because they were referred a patient by one of their general, general dermatology colleagues, and the hope was tissue preservation for Mohs surgery. But once they begin to see high-risk features, because recall that Mohs surgeons are also pathology trained, and they analyze their own pathology. And if they're concerned about their margins, or they see perineural invasion, one of the risk features is uh, greater than a 0.1 millimeter nerve involvement. And as the dermatologic surgeon, the Mohs surgeon, sees that under the microscope, then they're the ones who should be triggering referral to a head and neck surgeon uh, uh, or a plastic surgeon, the medical and the radiation oncologist, really as early as possible because simiplumab may begin to play a role earlier in therapy, particularly in combinations where that might make both work better than either one alone. The Keynote uh, 048 clinical trial uh, was a phase three trial uh, moving anti-PD-1, in this case pembrolizumab, earlier into therapy uh, in disease stage. So FDA approval in 2016 for nivolumab and pembrolizumab was for so-called second line or platinum refractory head and neck cancer patients. So it made sense to move it into first line. And this population has a single standard of care called the extreme regimen. That's platinum, 5-FU, and cetuximab. Now that's a pretty aggressive regimen and it's somewhat difficult to tolerate. And so the Keynote 048 trial was a three-arm trial of over 800 patients. The three different arms were of course extreme as the control arm compared to monotherapy with anti-PD-1 pembrolizumab or compared to uh, a combination of pembrolizumab with platinum and 5-FU, so replacing the cetuximab with pembrolizumab. Uh, the results of this have only been announced by press release. The uh, actual data are being presented orally uh, in Munich at the ESMO 2018, uh, almost as we speak. The press release indicated that monotherapy with pembrolizumab beat the three-drug extreme regimen of platinum 5-FU cetuximab. All the press release indicated was that monotherapy with pembrolizumab was better in the population who had higher than 20% PD-L1 ligand expression. This is with the composite score, the CPS. That looks at and scores PD-L1 expression on either the tumor cell or the inflammatory cell. So that composite score of greater than 20% uh, positivity was the population that the press release indicated 
monotherapy with pembrolizumab had better overall survival, significantly better, and met its primary endpoint versus three drugs of chemotherapy. What we're waiting to hear is what was the upfront response rate of the extreme three drug chemo versus pembrolizumab monotherapy. We'd like to see data on the lower than 20% intent to treat population, the whole group. And then missing from the press release was what Pembro plus chemo, that third arm, and whether that was as good or better than the three-drug chemo, either in response or overall survival.